Thank you for inviting me. I'm I'm really honored for the for the thought. Um, uh, I, would, uh, I would present today uh, the solidity based processing of 3D point clouds. But before I do, um, I would like to say a few words about yes. myself. Uh, just so you will know more or less where I come from. So I'm originally from Israel, even at the moment I'm in Israel. Um, I finished uh, my three degrees. I graduated from the Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology, um, in, in the mapping and the geoinformation department. Both my master's and PhD were dealing with the point clouds, with processing point clouds, and both were under the supervision of Professor Segifelin. Uh, we will look a little bit, or we will see some of my works uh, on my PhD. We know Sagi very well. <laughs> we know each other. <laughs> Greetings to him. <laughs> I actually have, uh, have a, a memory of you coming to visit, so... <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Um, so uh, I will I will present some of my work in uh, my PhD, my master's. Is, I did it a very long time ago, and I think we continue to to study things. And um, yeah, um, during that time, I was also a teaching assistant at the Technion. I was teaching um, adjustment computation, photogrammetry, image processing. Um, and some surveying, also surveying, uh, surveying courses, both for graduate and undergraduate levels. And I was working in the photogrammetry and laser scanning lab, uh, which is Sagi's lab. Um, I was both the, I was both a researcher and uh, I was managing uh, the projects there. So talking to students and and tutoring and whatever the or scanning outside for many campaigns. Um, and so forth. Today, I'm a Marie Curie Fellow at the TU Wien, which is how I met Nina, um, and I'm working on detection of geomorphological entities uh, from 3D point clouds, basically, or as I usually uh, work with laser scanners, this is also the orientation. But we are talking on 3D point clouds, and um, after there being point clouds, if they were acquired by photogrammetry or laser scanning from the processing side, I'd rather not to say there is a much difference because we're working on geometry. Um, so now that you know a little bit more about me and my and the voice um, behind the, the computer, uh, let's start. So we would like to explore the saliency, what is saliency and how do we find it within 3D point clouds. And as Jack already sent us uh, this definition from Wikipedia on the that saliency is actually the quality of being noticeable or important. We are looking for something that is um, conspicuous. If you look at the pictures to the right, you will see that your eyes are immediately focusing on the biker. The background is much less important. We, we notice it only later. So it's a neurological principle that we are Taking, we cannot, of course, sense the whole environment in one moment. And as animals, we want to limit our resources to the important things. So the eye always focuses on the conspicuous um, entities within the surrounding. Salient regions as such, they attract our immediate, immediate attention. They, this is the first thing we notice when we look at a picture and for that matter on, on a point cloud. And it has been used quite a bit in image processing, um, whether for object recognition, registration, similarity, um, evaluations, etc. cetera. And um, we were thinking maybe we should use it for point clouds only because there is no knowledge about the, the scene that we are, we are in. And we are just using the information within the scene. So we don't need to know anything before about what we are looking at. We are just looking for things that are conspicuous, for things that are um, that are distinguishable. And the idea is that when we are uh, thinking on the neurological principle, we know that the eye is more sensitive to the center than its surrounding. So the, the neurons in the retina are more uh, sensitive in the middle, in the center. And then we are always looking for the center 
um, in comparison to or in reference to its surrounding. And there were some works done in, uh, in point clouds, not that many as you would think. Uh, the first one was in 2013. And what they did, they said, let's use the FPFH, I don't know if you know, know it, the fast point feature histogram that is based on measuring the distribution of the normals within a, within a, a, a surrounding. So for every point, let's look at the surrounding, let's build a histogram of all the directions that we have and measure the dissimilarity between the, the histograms. The thing is that this is very a very long process because not only that you need to build the histogram, the uh, computation of the distance between histograms is of course um, not three-dimensional, it's much more because we are checking, we are, we are um, measuring between two histograms. And this was quite quite slow even though Many did this, many used this approach because it was so um, efficient. Yeah, you can see the results. Um, we see the Max Planck and the Dragon. We will go back, to, we will be with them for a little while. And uh, you can see that they did find the salient regions. Um, a few years later or two years later came uh, another work that said, OK, maybe instead of checking every point according or comparing every point with its surrounding, let's make clusters and only check the, dif the dissimilarity between the clusters. And you can see that we get a, a pretty good result. The only problem is that it loses the locality. And then um, came another work uh, not too long ago, so only in 2019, and they said, let's do both. Let's use both the, the global, so let's use both clusters and a point-based um, uh, comparison. And this really made them very robust to noise, but still it was not, uh, it is quite a slow process. Another approach said, leave this uh, FPFH, we don't want to use this. We also know that the curvature has some influence on the way that the uh, surface um, is different from its surrounding. And um, let's make a, a PCA analysis and see uh, with with a covariance of normal both normal and curvature and see how different uh, this this point is uh, they they built sigma sets and they they compared it uh, I don't want to go into it but the problem was that it is it, it is very uh, much computational um, intensive so we have exponential runtime and um, of course with when we start using point clouds big point clouds we we get into um, into a bit of a problem. So what we can see in this really short review of works is that first there's very much, li very little research done. I was quite surprised to see that really nobody even, I, I started um, um, dealing with saliency in 2018 and there were literally three or four works and it was quite amazing. Today you will see that things are a bit different, but um, most of them are based on the FPFH uh, uh, analysis. And as we, I don't know if you already saw this, but most models are uh, applied on watertight models. And of course, uh, it has its problems because when we are talking about topography, we're talking about much more um, points, like the data set is much bigger. And of course, the, the topography itself is not so, um, it's not as 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 uh, sorry I, I lost my English word for this. Um, it is not so noticeable, right? Here we really know that the horns of the of the dragon is the conspicuous areas. The nose of Max Planck is the conspicuous area. But when we are going when we are moving to um, topography, things are a little bit different. So first of all, our um, features are embedded within the topography. We have a very uh, continuous surface. The area is much larger. We have much more points. And of course, um, we, we cannot distinguish it so easily. And we need to think about something that is a bit more sensitive. On the other hand, of course, we have the texture, which we should think about how to make it insensitive to, to uh, texture 
but sensitive enough to catch the uh, subtle entities, as I call them, uh, within the, the topography. And when you look at this image of the sinkholes and gullies in the Dead Sea area, your eyes again notice the, the gullies, and after the gullies you notice the sinkholes, and only then you notice the, the, the flat surface. So that means that we can use visual saliency for this uh, for for analyzing for analyzing the for analyzing the data. So what we thought we thought of uh, an idea and uh, to to we thought of an idea a new idea for for saliency and we tried to think what when does a surface um, stand out from its surrounding. And of course, we have to use surface features, right? We have to use normals, we have to use curvature because these basically define the, the change within the surface. The thing is that when we are talking about, um, about, surf, about topography, then of course the very close region does not change. It changes only in the wider area. So the, the very first contact with our neighbors we probably wouldn't see much change, but we will see it only on a further uh, on further areas. And this is why we thought about a center surround operator. So it works with the principle of the saliency. Only, as you can see here in the um, in the waiting function, the very immediate surrounding has no influence. And only as we go further and further from the um, from the center, we will have more and more influence. And then, of course, it doesn't matter anymore because we are looking too far. So we will measure the difference in normals and in curvature with using this uh, weighting function. And so we will have the center surround operator and the um, evaluation of the difference. When we're talking about surface, surface features, of course, we need to think of how do we estimate the normals and how do we estimate the, the curvature. With the normals, it is, I think today, most people, or it's already a convention that you use the PCA-based estimation and you just choose the smallest uh, eigenvector to um, as the normal. But um, for the curvature, it is a bit more complex. Some people say, which curvature? Do we want to use the mean curvature? The, do we want to use the Gaussian curvature? And it gets a bit more complicated also how do you even define the surface and we decided that because we want it to be efficient and we don't want to have any complexity with this um, what we did was just projecting every point to the normal and summing uh, and summing the the projections and then we basically know whether uh, whether the the uh, point is convex or concave and this would be enough for um, for analyzing whether it is distinct or not. Of course, we also have to consider, as I said, texture and roughness. And uh, we, what we did here was using a statistical test to see if the change really is bigger than, uh, than the, the statistical uh, change that you would expect according to what, and this is something that we had to know according to what we know of the surface uh, roughness. Of course, uh, this can also be found empirically when you are analyzing. Eventually, we will take the two um, differences that we already found and uh, we will sum them or put them together after normalization into the saliency, um, into a, one expression of saliency where the exponent here are only as our um, the role is only for normalization because of course the scale of the numbers for the difference in normals is one thing and the curvature is a different thing so um, we have to normalize it and before we even start using using the saliency for topography and and see how how that works uh, we wanted to make sure that we stand with the other um, with the other works that have been done in this in the field and you can see the results here and you can see that we have pretty good results even when we are using the watertight models that we did not um, aim for right so 
that was uh, basically it. And if we are looking at the, at the runtime, you can see that we were com computing it in Python, so it's a much slower um, uh, language, and, and you can see that we did it quite fast for the same for the same data set. So um, we also have this runtime um, efficiency within this um, with with this idea. And um, I don't want to show you the saliency results as is. I would like to show you how I use it for other processing. So the first example, I will give two examples. I think it's. Uh, I hope I, I'm not too too long. Um, so the first example is the simplification of uh, of point clouds, and I'm sure that all of you know that when we are using point clouds, we always have this pro this problem of too many points. And then what we do, we start resampling or downsampling, reducing, however you want to call it, simplify. Um, then what we do, we downsample the, the point cloud, we reduce the number of points, and uh, then we either are much, it's much more easy to process the data, or we can even discover new patterns that we didn't see before be only because we had so many points. And the thing is that usually we scan according to the resolution we think that we need, but then the whole environment is being scanned at the same resolution and we have this problem of number of points. So this is the motivation basically for, for the simplification. And of course, there were a lot of works done. The, the first work started with mesh compression because they said, okay, we know how to do mesh compression, so let's, let's uh, convert the point cloud into mesh and then um, do the re the reduction using the mesh and go back to the to the point clouds and um, the, there are all kinds of works whether it's uh, Poisson disks on or or the the um, triangles the the angle between triangles that you want to reduce and then iteratively go over and so forth um, but of course we have a problem that uh, we don't want to actually turn convert everything to a mesh because then we are very much reliant on the quality of the mesh and this is a whole new research uh, to start um, so another approach was to use directly to directly the points and then the most common one uh, common approaches are the grid based and the voxel based and this is where what they do they just divide the data into um, uniform cells and they say, okay, from each cell, we will just take one point or as many as we want. And you can see in the example that I show here to the right that after a while, we just lose everything, right? We can't even notice in the uh, five centimeters, we, can't, we can hardly notice uh, what we are looking for, which is, I don't know if you can see this, the, those small things here, but don't worry, you will see it better when I uh, will show our saliency. But you can see how, how they are, we really lose every, uh, every structure within this. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot I had uh, two slides there. So um, what we are looking for, we look to retain the important regions. We, we want to retain the structure within the scene, the important structure. Uh, we also don't want our um, point cloud to be completely different. So the point cloud after reduction, we don't want it to be different from the original one. And uh, we want it to be, to have the same surfaces, to, to show us the same surfaces as we have in, in our, um, in the new point cloud. So we don't want to lose any information on one hand. On the other hand, we do want to, re to simplify the point cloud. Um, and, and what we decided is because we have the saliency, so we already have what is important within the point cloud. So now all we need to do is just make sure that we are not reducing any important point. And um, within every uh, within every ball in, in a radius that we want to simplify, we just pick one point, and this point would be the closest to the average within the cell. This can be implemented quite easily when we're using the ball tree data structure because um, it just inherently already 
um, organized as as uh, as as spheres. So uh, when we're using this, we can do the simplification quite fast. And uh, if we look at the results, so we are going back to the Dead Sea uh, data set. We will go back to it even once more. And um, you can see here that the uh, distribution of points, because it's a laser, it's airborne laser scanner, uh, we have overlapping scan lines. So we have some places that are more dense, some places that are less dense. And um, we also have uh, points or entities that are very flat and entities that are quite um, deep. And we actually, if we would use the grid or voxel based, we wouldn't know which which cell to choose. But here uh, we are using the, the saliency and you can see that the saliency really shows well all the all the sinkholes. And I just want to uh, note that you wouldn't even notice this sinkhole here. I don't know if you can see the the uh, mouse. I hope that you can, but um, there is one sinkhole here that you wouldn't even notice it here. It's quite, it, it is so non-conspicuous to our eyes, but on the other hand, um, geometrically it is. And if we're looking, at, we are doing a comparison with points, with other uh, approaches and our approach, you can see the, the results quite nicely and, and you can see that, um, well, first of all, we reduced with uh, we reduced the, the number of points by 91, almost 92 percent. And um, uh, we did all kinds of all, all um, four spatial spacings for the for the simplification and um, you can see that at five meters, with all other uh, approaches, we can hardly notice anything. While in our approach, there's not much difference. We really eliminate only the non-important uh, flat surface, right? And um, uh, another another example is in a more uh, mountainous terrain, which is a, a, an alpine terrain. You can see here again the uh, very big slopes, very cha uh, much changing topography. And um, when we do the, the saliency based reduction, you can see that um, ours is the most um, full, right? So we can see here and here that we are not losing any information on the topography when using the, uh, the saliency based simpl simplification. Uh, the last, the last uh, example here with the with the subsampling is what I showed you already uh, using the um, on the uh, on a data set which is an archaeological site. It's an open site in the, in the desert in Israel, and again you could see that when we showed the whole points, we hardly saw any structure. And on the other hand, when we are looking at the saliency. Uh, the saliency image you can see already that you have all the all the stones here everything is very much um apparent to our eyes even though uh, it was there in the in the in the data from to begin with right so there's no processing here only the saliency and when we are doing the down sampling um it stopped working oh sorry yeah when we are using the down sampling uh, we can see that everything, uh, again, in other, in other uh, approaches, we hardly see any structure, while in ours, it doesn't matter because we keep the important, uh, the important features. It should be said that we, because we are using the original points, when we are choosing which point to, return, to retain, even from the non-important areas, we do not have any difference between the the original cloud and our cloud. So our our uh, approach is always zero with the cloud to cloud distance. On the other hand, when we're using the voxel based or the mesh based or the curvature, where um, all of these methods will always have some kind of distance between the the original and the down sampled point. Here I just gave an example for the voxel based, which you can see it's. 23 centimeters um, when we are looking at the um, at the uh, five centimeter five meters down sampling, right? So uh, not only that we found a, um, 
an approach that will retain the important features, it is also very much like or very much similar to the original point cloud. So that was one, one example of how we can use saliency. The, the second example is uh, what I said before, that was more uh, what I did in my PhD. And um, this is the extraction of entities from 3D point clouds. And we are going back to, to this picture from, from the Dead Sea. And we think, okay, what do we need to do in order to actually extract uh, and characterize the features, the geomorphological features in this scene? And the problem with it, with geomorphological features is that they are seamlessly embedded within the surface. They are part of the topography. We, they don't stand out like buildings or poles or things like this. And um, of course, they have multiple shapes and forms. We, we cannot say, okay, we are looking for a cylinder. We're looking for a flat surface. We cannot do this. And also, um, we have all kinds of sizes and shapes and types, and of course, we are not confined to one specific domain, right? So we could see gullies. We here we see laminas that are uh, created. I'm sure that you know it uh, in the limestone near, near the sea. We have all kinds of things that we want to characterize, and um, the problem is that today most methods, or if I'm not mistaken. All methods are entity specific. They say, okay, we want to find gullies, we want to find drumlins, we want to find um, uh, shorelines, we want to find, right? So they are very much specific. And we don't want to be specific because when we're talking about nature, we have indefinite types of things that we would like to see. Um, so we don't want to develop a method for every each one of them, right? We want to have something that is more attuned to the geometry and not to a specific uh, thing. Another thing is that you would say, wait, but today we have machine learning and all you, could, you need to do is to start tagging and sampling and then afterwards the machine will do everything for you. But the problem is that as it is with machine learning, it is much reliant on the sampling. And when we start sample, especially when we start sampling a lot of things, works have shown that it is not so accurate after uh, after several hundreds, uh, which we need for the for the machine learning, and also that when we are when we are sampling on on point clouds, we always have a problem with the shading. Do we really look at the right place, right? So it's not always that accurate as is. So of course, if we will feed the machine learning uh, machine. Uh, uh, with bad sampling, we will get bad results. So it's not really the way to go. We need to have a data set that is correct and accurate to start this process. So what we are looking for is a, what we were looking for is a general methodology that is unsupervised that uh, we can understand the mechanism of the uh, of the extraction or of the uh, features themselves using the geometry, the ge their geometry um, characteristics. And of course, we don't want to have any prior um, uh, assumption about them. So we don't want to assume that they are planar or anything like this, right? Or they have a round shape or anything. We want to have something that is completely general. Um, and of course, we have this tool that we already said, we have the saliency tool. So how do we even um, say what is a, a good delineation of a feature? Well, we are looking for a curve that is continuous, that is short, right? We don't want it to have too many turns and twists around. And uh, we want it to be part of the topography. We want it to accommodate the topography um, and be part of it. And of course, we don't want to have any uh, constraints on initialization. We don't want to know how many features we have. We don't want to know more or less whereabouts. We don't know, want to have any of these things. And um, it has been offered uh, way back uh, to use um, levels, the level set, um, uh, the level set method. Usually, they did it on on images. I did not see many works on point clouds. And um, the nice thing is that if we're using the implicit representation of the curve, 
we are not constrained to a specific number of, uh, of, con of curves. We can have um, a surface that is changing and we have multiple curves and it is of course updated easily. And um, since we already have the saliency idea, then we say, okay, all the features that are salient will be inside the curve and the non-salient outside of the curve. For this, we, uh, we use the, the um, uh, optimization function that says exactly this. Everything that is inside should be homogeneous. Everything outside should be homogeneous. And then we have some normalization um, uh, um, part that will have, will say, okay, we want it to have a specific uh, length. We don't want it to be, or to be um, penalized on the length, right? We want it to be as short as possible. And uh, we are using the saliency map. We want minimum variance. We want it to be a smooth uh, um, curve. And this is exactly what uh, we see here. And the nice thing about this is that uh, basically, oh, no, I'm missing one, sorry. That basically uh, we can start from a, a circle in the middle and just uh, advance the, the curve as we go iteratively. So it will have the uh, homogeneity as we as I just said of inside and outside and the nice thing is and now I please pay attention because this video is super fast we start now from, not from one circle in the in the middle but from very small ones around the the image and you can see how fast it converges and we have uh, exactly the same result that means that we are not constrained to the initialization um, condition not only this, but the, the uh, optimization also gives us the possibility to incorporate other channels. So if we have, because we're using laser scanners, we have intensity. Sometimes we have RGB, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we have uh, some hyperspectral information and sometimes we don't. We just want to use all the information that we have, but it, at its base, it has to be geometric. And um, you can see here in the, again, we are looking at the same data set and now there's a bit more uh, information on what we have because it's much more important to see the variability of the features we have in the, in the uh, data set. And you have small sinkholes, big sinkholes, uh, deep sinkholes, shallow sinkholes, and of course, galleys in all kinds of sizes and shapes. And uh, as we saw before, we have the, the saliency uh, map uh, that we saw earlier and if we're looking at the uh, extraction of the of the points of the sorry of the entities you can see that we started from a, an arbitrary circle in the middle of the um, in the middle of the of the data set and with time we just find all the sinkholes and uh, gullies according again according to the um, saliency map and the Performance is not that bad. We have a 93% um, precision and 88% recall. And the nice thing, again, you don't need any prior information. You don't need any initialization. You don't need anything. So this can give us quite a good starting point for the machine learning that we would like maybe to do afterwards. Um, so this is the, the eventual uh, result where I divided between or I, I distinguish between sinkholes that are round and uh, gullies that are not. And you can see the, the, the result is, is quite impressive, I think. Another uh, um, thing that we did was looking what would happen when we have very little uh, change in geometry. So we took a masonry, an old masonry wall, and you can see that the with the, the profiles here, you can see that we have very small changes in, in geometry. And in the intensity, we have some change. And of course, if we, use, if we would have used this picture only or this information as is, we couldn't have found the, the masonry, the, the blocks themselves. Um, the thing is that when we are using only intensity, only the intensity channel, we can find some some of the stones and but if we're using the saliency based you can see that with when we're talking about saliency we find much more um much more stones than before 
if we are using both of them, you can see a much fuller uh, and and more complete de description of the of the uh, of the wall, which is really good for heritage conservation and so forth. And you can see that the that even the uh, precision and recall are uh, being um, improved with this uh, with this idea with this combination of multiple channels into the um, optimization uh, equation. Um, so just uh, as a wrap up, we saw that we can highlight important things using saliency without prior information, which is completely geometric. Um, it has a very simple implementation and we can use it in all kinds of applications. Um, the problem is, or not the problem, but of course we can make the saliency better. We can even study it and, and see what makes it, uh, or, or using machine learning, of course, to estimate the saliency, and of course we can try and use it on other uh, in other applications and in other domains. Um, yeah, this is it for me. I hope it wasn't I was good with time. And uh, thank you for listening. And if there are any questions or you want to discuss this, uh, I would be happy. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. We'll just do this back to see you. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, okay, finally. Do you hear me? Yes. Because I'm frozen somehow. Okay, so indeed, very interesting research. Uh, I'm really amazed from the results that you have. Um, and I'm wondering, did you try this approach also on houses? On point uh, clouds of, um, yeah. No, I did not. Well, houses, I, I did only facades. As, as you can see, I have another... Yeah. Uh, another to reconstruct the roofs? No, no, I did not. Basically, my thought was that it is... Um, that the buildings are very conspicuous as is, and you can do other uh, analysis that is not um, so sensitive to, to height differences. But, uh, yeah, I, di I did not use... I did not check it in the urban mm. environment. Yeah, well, it would be very interesting to see what is going to the, what kind of results you're going to obtain. Because in urban environment, okay, you have the trees. And actually because of the trees, many of the other approaches don't work well. Um, fitting shapes and uh, delineating the structure of the roof. So probably from here you can get uh, quite interesting results that uh, after that you can continue yeah, trying to get uh, the shape of the roof. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, I have actually on the procedure one uh, uh, question. When you are mapping the points to be able to estimate the um, uh, DAO, so on the, on the basis of the normal vector, um, and you mentioned, you had at the beginning some uh, diagram mentioning that you project the neighboring points on the normal vector. Yeah. So, uh, how, how many points you consider really like a significant, what is the threshold to be able to uh, decide that, uh, yeah, this is a salience uh, point and so you can use it? This this really depends on on the data because if uh, it depends what you what size of features you're looking for, so mm -hmm. uh, you will look for um, uh, an environment or a neighborhood. The size of the neighborhood will be dictated by the size of the feature that you want to look for, and mm -hmm. uh, and I just use all the neighbors there. And this is really mm -hmm. the bottleneck. It is the bottleneck because. If you use two less points, then of course you don't have any information or you don't get enough information to estimate the curvature. And if mm -hmm. you use many, then of course it is very time, time consuming. Mm. So we are somewhere in the middle. Yeah, there. and in a way, uh, now for these examples that you have, how do you decide? Is just uh, trying what kind of neighborhood you are going to consider or, um, or you have already some indications okay for this type of data set with this kind of resolution i'm going to use um, um, this kind of neighborhood 
Yeah, so usually what I do, I look for the for the smallest feature in the data set I would like to find. And mm -hmm. I just make it size. I don't even do it uh, smartly, right? So I just fly around the, the, the point cloud and I look for small things and then I measure it. And the first one I have, this is the, the neighborhood mm. that I... So okay. it's, yeah. I, yeah, it's not very smart. But on the other hand, it's very effective. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And actually, you're doing the, the whole processing now on the basis directly on the point cloud. You don't create mesh. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 And oh. we have actually we did some we did some uh, uh, experiments now uh, for uh, for completely 3D. So what you could see now, it's two and a half D, right? And we were using the saliency on a cave. And okay. uh, you could also see very good results there, which, is, okay. which, was, which was quite uh, enlightening because we didn't know what to look for in the cave and suddenly the saliency uh, took everything out. The thing is that the results are not still on a presentation level, so... <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Caves are indeed very difficult to... You cannot find any features inside. You don't know what, even what to look for. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's really very interesting. And what else can you detect using salience? Um, probably you have a better idea now. I'm trying to think of some other applications, but uh, yeah. is it going to help? For example, Nina is busy with trees. Is it going to help something in processing point clouds of vegetation point clouds or? Um, yeah. So with the vegetation point clouds, I think it's a bit. It will have to be adapted because the trees have the crowns, and then uh, of course every point will be different from from the other, which is mm. something we tried to accommodate when we did the the uh, statistical test. But mm -hmm. it's working with this such a big variance within the crown, right? Because every point is somewhere else, and the surface that you uh, that you um, fit is completely crazy and and then there's nothing you can you can do um, right. what we are doing now we are searching for um, logs that are sunk within uh, within rivers mm. so we are using the bathymetric laser scanner and uh, searching for logs mm. so this is something that we're doing as I said with the cave also uh, we're using it in a cave and um, so actually, it's more like you need to have some kind of surface. Yes. Um, the the surface might not be very well distinguishable, but some kind of something, uh, continuous surface, a stone, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, a terrain, or, uh, yeah, something that you know that there is some curvature and you can try to estimate the, the curvature. Exactly. Hmm. Very and it, yeah. was, it was developed from the beginning, it was developed for terrain, right? And uh, I was quite surprised to see it works on the water type models because it was really not the purpose. I said, okay, just let's see how it works. And it did, and it was quite impressive, but not, not the plan. Uh, yeah. and, and this is why I say that maybe with buildings, um, it will be possible to, to see it. So with buildings, I just didn't try because I am mostly working on open environments. So yeah, yeah. Actually, we have uh, here discussed with um, one company that is, um, uh, yeah, maintaining the stone uh, heritage uh, uh, structures in um, uh, New South Wales. And uh, yeah, they have all kind of uh, old buildings with these stone, uh, cut stones. And actually, they're very much uh, interested in an approach that they can estimate, um, okay, what is the size of the stones? And also some cracks and quality of the stones uh, to replace uh, uh, bad quality stones. And yeah, also, something about um, the roof uh, uh, and the tails, tiles on, on the roof. Mm -hmm. 
So probably this this approach is going to be quite uh, successful in this uh, type of applications. Yes, um, as as I showed, there's the this um, we call it the, the leopards. No, not the wall. The the leopards. Um, uh, you know those structures that I tr I showed with the down sampling. Ah, okay. Mm. So uh, we also did. Uh, we used also the level set approach. Uh, there and we also find found these really nice structures. Even though the stones there are three centimeters, they are really inside the the surface, so they mm. scout only by I think two or three centimeters high, and okay. and uh, and we could find them. I mean, this was yeah. Uh, it, it is. I think that the the approach is sensitive enough, like the saliency okay. is sensitive enough. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Some more questions? Oh, it's uh, very nice research. Nobody has questions. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's either a good thing or bad thing. <laughs> it was yeah, a really, yeah, really excellent work. I mean, so uh, adaptable and um, applicable to many different applications, you know. Yeah. Um, have you have you so have you been getting much interest from practitioners or developers or um, for the next few steps? You know? uh, well, I, I got a grant. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm at the moment uh, not that much, but I don't know how much exposure do I have because uh, the, this work, the what I did in my PhD is now under review, so we are uh, about to publish it very soon, I hope. And um, yeah, and the downsampling is the the next one, so I guess we are we are just on the road there. But um, yeah, the the idea of of the project that I'm in now was to develop it a bit further. So I guess right. somebody somebody thought there is a <laughs> yeah, sure. and uh, for the in what kind of direction? What do you want to detect more? Uh, so, um, yeah, the 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 uh, work or the study that I'm in now, the project is is more about geomorphological entities, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the idea is, as I said, to accommodate more for texture because the saliency now is not that. So I can't really estimate the roughness in order to. Um, uh, adjust the detection. So I want to try and develop saliency, me saliency uh, measure that is more robust to roughness and, and texture uh, variability. And I think, I mean, with image processing, they already, they're already deep into machine learning saliency measures. And uh, I would like to, to go there and see how how can I use this and um, this is basically the second part of my of my study now my current study okay. Okay. yeah yeah very interesting Hi. thank you I have one question just yes yeah uh, you worked completely on Python based you know coding yes. and everything application so is it available for someone to use it or something like that or uh, no because it's a real mess okay. <laughs> But uh, now, I'm, yeah. now I'm, wor I'm working on a on an implementation that is uh, much more efficient, and it is uh, um, it's using opals. I don't know if you already yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. It is just opals for running because it runs much faster. Uh, when we start with big point clouds, then you have to have the the efficiency of of the C plus plus, or else you would just sit yep. for hours. And uh, and this will be available quite soon. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'd love to use it. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will yeah. let you know once when it's online. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Thank and you. It's a nice presentation. Very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So we don't have uh, many questions. Just because it's so impressive, so <laughs> nobody can think of some. <laughs> well, it's, one, one, it's so neat and uh, resolved. And <laughs> <laughs>
very much. <laughs> Thank you for this. Yeah. Yeah, well, if you think of anything else, um, I'm always available, uh, either through Nina or um, through my email. Uh, yeah. yeah. Are you on Twitter at all? Or uh, anything like that? You Are what? You on Twitter? Twitter? No, no, I'm, I'm not really a social network kind of person. Good for you, good for you. Uh, I, you I have a research gate it. that is a very un under-maintained research gate, uh, okay. so you can find me That's there as well. But I check once in a while and I'm, I'm really bad with those social media. Uh, <laughs> yeah, even if you find me on Facebook, just know that the next time will be in a couple of months. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm not not so good at it. <laughs> I, I was wondering something. You mentioned that you have able to um, distinguish uh, three centimeters uh, uh, difference between the different uh, yeah uh, stones. Yeah. Um, do you think it's going to be possible to again with some adjustments to um, identify cracks? in some surfaces, like in bridges and, um, you know, some parts of the of um, bridge or on a wall, if you have a complete surface and uh, you have a crack somewhere. Yeah, uh, so the, the funny thing is that this whole work started from cracks. <laughs> ah, okay. uh, and then we saw that it can be uh, generalized and we we kind of left the cracks uh, behind but yes I think it can work with cracks okay. uh, yeah. of yeah. course the, the question is how big the cracks are of uh, course. yeah you have to have a really dense point cloud to be able to yes. uh, yeah kind of uh, get points in the cracks to be able to identify them that's clear but this uh, always can be done it's about if you do monitoring and you want to automatically detect this kind of uh, uh, features, uh, then, of course, you have to do something about it to be able to uh, yeah. first get the, the cracks uh, somewhere in some data set. Mm, OK, that's that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember this. Work. I never tried it, but I think it should work. I, I don't see any reason why not. Yeah, 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 very interesting. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll keep in mind that, uh, yeah, you are doing something like that and could be that uh, next year I might contact you. We have a, uh, next year some project will, a project will start exactly on monitoring uh, health of uh, assets, uh, bridges, uh, all kind of, um, yeah, constructions. So, could be that uh, yeah we come up with uh, some questions to you. Probably by this time you'll have the software also available. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I hope I hope it will be in the next couple of weeks already. So yes. <laughs> Can I touch on that, Cece? Um, sure. Someone okay. from uh, Nubit's team. His name is Gottfried. Um, he's running a point cloud processing for uh, using Opaz, or I think it's ALS using Opaz course next beginning of next year. Um, it's a one week or two week intensive course, and you have to pay for it. It's um, I, I I don't know the specifics exactly. Um, I can forward it on if anyone is interested um, mm. in the course. And yeah, it's using your pads. Mm. Okay, okay, very nice. Yeah. <clears throat> if it is not very expensive, some students can follow it. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Still no questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it Thank was you. a really great presentation.